Welcome back to Painting Trafalgar. I decided that I needed to have a um, an episode where I just talked about what the battle was. Uh, I, I was talking about the Battle of Trafalgar here, and talk about the Battle of Trafalgar there, but I wasn't, you know, what I was doing was assuming that everybody knew the story. The story is the battle took place October 21st. It was a Monday, it was 1805, and it happened right here. This is Spain, and this is the Mediterranean Sea. This is Gibraltar and the Straits of Gibraltar. This is Africa. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And the battle takes place right here. Cadiz is a harbor town. It's been there for hundreds of years. And you can see even on this map what a terrific harbor it is. So the Franco-Spanish fleet is in there. We call it the Franco-Spanish fleet, or the combined fleet, because the French had defeated the Spanish and had absorbed their navy. They Here on this drawing, the French ships are white and the Spanish ships are gray, and they're fighting together under a joint command, under Villeneuve. Um, he's the admiral who is in charge of the overall fleet. but. In the Franco-Spanish fleet, there are other admirals, and they're not all French. Some of them are, uh, are Spanish. Um, there's three admirals in the British column. And the, <laughs> that'll surprise some of you, because everybody remembers Nelson, and everybody remembers Collingwood. But um, who remembers Admiral Northesk, I ask? Anyway, um, we also got a guy named Dumanoir the Palais. He's um, the one all the way up in front, and he's on one of these ships. And he was all the way in the back. And this will take some explaining. Um, Dumanois has, I'm sorry, Villeneuve, who is in overall command. Um, Villeneuve is 42 years old. Nelson's 47. Collingwood's 57. Uh, just for... For context, this is all about context. The French have a bunch of their ships in their combined fleet with the Spanish here in Cadiz Harbor. And they're lingering. And Napoleon feels like they're they're shirking almost, like they should be getting to work. Napoleon has a job for them to do in the Mediterranean. But uh, Villeneuve just doesn't feel motivated to leave. He doesn't feel the conditions are right. You have to be very careful when you make this, you know, strategic movements with a large fleet of ships that are an asset. You risk losing them. And the, the British fleet, the Royal Navy, is in the Atlantic nearby, hoping that they are going to force a conflict between their navy and the Franco-Spanish fleet. The idea is they want to eliminate the Franco-Spanish fleet so they don't have to keep worrying about them. Once the Franco-Spanish fleet is eliminated, uh, Napoleon who represents a huge problem for the English, is confined to dry land. And the English have an island, so they're safe. But as long as Napoleon has a big fleet, the island is threatened because Napoleon really wants to move a, a fleet of invasion barges built for the purpose to move his ground forces, his soldiers, onto English soil and conquer the British on, on, the, on their own territory. So Admiral Nelson's job is to find and neutralize the Franco-Spanish fleet and prior to the day we're talking about, he'd spent the best part of the year chasing the fleet literally back and forth across the Atlantic. So he's finally in a position now, the night before the battle, he's hovering offshore out of sight of land, and he has sent in his frigates who have scouted out the situation and are reporting back to him. So Nelson over here is aware of what's going on over here. Villeneuve in here is less aware of what's going on. He can see that there's an English ship or two out here, but he's unaware of the enormous fleet. He's worried about it. But he's also worried that Napoleon is tired of his, um, his nonsense, and he's gotten word that Napoleon has sent his replacement. So if Villeneuve remains in Cadiz, one day the door is going to knock and he'll open it, and it's going to be another admiral with a letter from Napoleon saying, the bearer of this letter is now in charge of the fleet, and you had better come back and explain to me why you're not, uh, I don't know, being a better admiral. That's a cartoonish take on it, but it isn't really that far from the truth. 
So Villeneuve uh, has the cooperation of the Spanish admirals, but they don't want to leave because the weather is bad. There's bad weather coming in. Everybody can tell. They can read the signs. There are these swells on the surface of the ocean, and there's been a series of storms coming in. There had been a storm the night before the battle, although not all the ships suffered the damage from the storm or the effects of the storm. Um, Villeneuve decides to leave. He enters the Atlantic, and he sails his ship and all the other ships in, in a line. Villeneuve is at the middle of the line. The front of the line is down here. They're all sailing this way, out of Cadiz. Dawn breaks... And I'm assuming that's at, at like 6 in the morning, but I don't know. Dawn breaks, and he sees the British fleet nearby, 5 miles away, 8 miles away. So he realizes if he keeps going into the Mediterranean being chased by Nelson, it's worse than if he just turns around and goes back to Cadiz. So that's what he does. He has each one of his captains, by sending up flag signal flags to the top of his masthead, he can put the signal up to the masthead. A flag starts waving that has a specific meaning. Everybody else sees it, and they get the message, which is to turn together. So they're not going to turn like this one turns and goes this way, and then this one follows him and goes this way. No, they're all going to individually turn around. So all the boats at this end, all the ships were facing this way, and they were behind the lead ship, which was this one. But when the command is given to turn about... They all turn, and now the ships that were all the way in the back are now all the way in the front. And they're heading north now to get back into Cadiz. As Nelson gets his ships together at first light into these two columns, he's already ahead of time decided he's going to attack it in this fashion. Instead of having all his ships in a straight line like the Franco-Spanish fleet, he has two lines. And he's in the, in the victory, the HMS victory, 100 guns, in command of what they call the weather column, because the wind is blowing from this direction. This is the weather column, and this is the lee column, <clears throat> as in a lee. If you're in the lee of a hill, that means you're on the side of the hill that's not getting hit by the wind. It's a sailor thing. On board Royal Sovereign, another 100-gun ship, is um, Cuthbert Collingwood. So he's another admiral. And that third admiral that I mentioned, Admiral Northesk, is back here somewhere, and it doesn't matter because like, there's a reason we all forget his name. Um, Nelson's idea is that his two prongs are going to cut into the center of the line of the Franco-Spanish fleet, and when he does that, he can he can defeat the, the the ships in the middle before the ships at either end can react. So, with Nelson's theory, um, you can defeat a superior enemy if you attack him at a vital point in the middle. If he had tried to form his line and go parallel and have a one-on-one -on -one mano a mano fight where each ship fights the other one, um, he had a greater chance of losing because the Spanish and the French have 33 ships of the line, and Nelson only has 27 ships of the line. Ships of the line are the large, um, um, powerful ships. They're smaller ones, and you can see them here in the drawing. There's uh, frigates and schooners and so on. Um, so what happens is the battle is joined uh, very slowly because on that morning... On October 21st, there's just not that much wind. If you were trying to fly a kite and you were standing out in the open with that same amount of wind, you would have to do one of those things where you have to run and pull the kite behind you. Like, <clears throat> the wind won't lift the kite and fly it away. There's just barely enough wind to get these ships going. So they all had all their sails set. So in some instances, uh, you only set some of the sails. Uh, this represents most of the sails set, and these lower ones are furled on this model. On Nelson's fleet, all of them had all the sails set, and then even some extra sails that come out the side called studding sails, which were rarely used, but you know, that was a thing. Um, and the wind still just blew his fleet at the slowest kind of a pace, about two miles an hour, like a walking pace. Like if you were walking on the surface of the water, you could keep up with these ships. They weren't speeding away. Everybody was having problems with that, and so did the Franco-Spanish fleet. That whole operation of turning around for them had gotten their line kind of wobbly. As you can see, it's not a very good straight line. And some of these ships are to the left and to the right of each other where they should have been you know, in a straight line like these ones are. But they've got, the wind is coming this way. Um, they're going to be able to catch the wind on the side of the sails, and it sort of pushes them this way. 
but they can't go very fast either. And later we're going to find out that these ships up here can't turn around to come and help the ships that are being stricken in the middle by the, the, the attack. So picture this in slow motion. The lead ships are going to enter the enemy line around noon, about 12. And it's going to be three hours before the ships all the way in the back finally get up into the battle. So it takes them about three hours. This is about... Maybe this is four miles. It's really just really slow, agonizing going. So in the morning when they sight the enemy, they're, they're back here further. But the enemy can start shooting at them before they can reply. Because the nature of these ships is that the guns fire out the side. You know, those, these, these little black holes are the, where the guns would point out. They don't really shoot out the front. So if you're in Admiral Nelson's ship coming towards the camera and the camera is on a Spanish ship, that's what you see, and that's what you're shooting at. So the, the the French and the Spanish ships were able to fire at will into the oncoming English and, uh, the, you know, the, the two columns of the English fleet, and the English could not fire back until they finally got close enough where they pierced the line. There's a painting I wanted to show you that's in this terrific book. <clears throat> Everybody should buy this book by Peter Goodwin, The Ships of Trafalgar. And he throws in some nice paintings, too. I'll just turn to it. this one painting of uh, Ad Nelson's HMS Victory breaking the line at Trafalgar. Let's see if I can find it. If I was wise, I would... Ah, here it is right here. So, this ship and this ship are Spanish, right? And this is the HMS Victory. And take a look at the sails. This is, the painter is Jeff Hunt. H-U-N-T, Hunt, um, and he's a very good nautical painter. The Victory's been slowly approaching. You can see the guns that are aimed out the side, but the Victory still cannot open fire. And look at this, the condition of the sails. These ships have been just shooting at them for you know the better part of an hour or two, blasting away at them. And what happens is they the English ships finally get in amongst the French and the Spanish fleet. And it devolves into like a hockey game where the, 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 the two teams start fighting. You know, they just spin off into their own little battles. It doesn't develop into a mathematical perfection where the ships all turn at the same time. They enter the line where they can, and then they fight the enemy that they can see. And it's just not very windy. So when they start firing off these cannon, like Victory has 100 guns, You've seen in the movies these clouds of smoke. The clouds of smoke don't blow away very fast, so everybody's blinded, and nobody can really see very far through the haze, and it becomes very confusing. Their logs it, uh, still exist, but uh, it's really hard to determine exactly what happens to each one of these ships when they enter the line. You know, they'll, they'll each have a chronometer on board, but the chronometers in 1805 didn't all agree with each other, so noon on one ship was actually 1130 on another. So when you read the log... Even the events that you're reading about from ship to ship are skewed as much as a half an hour or 45 minutes sometimes. They all, in their logs, uh, talk about the opening fire, you know, who started firing first. And uh, it was the Fugo who fired the very first shot, everybody agrees. And uh, firing at Royal Sovereign that entered the line before the victory got into position. But after that, it sort of devolves into a chaos. And then there are just a few other incidents that everybody saw and recorded in the log. The ship, the Achilles, the Achille down here, a French ship, catches fire at some point during the afternoon, and at 4 o'clock it explodes. The, the fire reaches the ship's magazine, and the ship explodes. And most histories that recount the battle use that as the, um, the stepping-off point and say, and that was the end of the battle, which it kind of was, because the shooting was over at that point. Um, but the drama was not over, because in the following days, um, some more things happened. At the end of the battle, actually, at the end of the middle of the battle, some of these ships all the way up in the in the the van, as it's called, V A N, um, were unable to turn around and get into battle. But then some of them um, didn't try very hard and actually sailed away. Now, were they cowardly escaping, you know, their duty, or was it that they were uh, unable to turn their ships in the light winds? And I think both things are true, but it's certainly easy to find historians who condemn them for a cowardly behavior, for not helping. And I'm sure the ships that were losing the battle in the middle 
um, were really distressed to see what some of the Franco-Spanish fleet was sailing away and not trying to sail towards them. There are a few instances of heroism, though, where some of these ships um, defied orders because there actually was um, Dumanois, the, the youngest admiral, I think, at the battle, actually flew the flags telling these guys to do that thing. Like, he, he gave the order to leave the battle. Not in so many words, but in, in, in the results of the commands that he gave, you know, steer this way and go, you know, that was to leave the battle. And um, there was a Spanish admiral who wasn't having it, and he actually took his boats out. You know, they had these smaller rowboats. <laughs> I'm getting off track, but I love the story. Um, he towed the, the bow around, so if the ship is... Um, you know, the wind is blowing from this direction, hitting the ship this way. It's hard to turn this way because the wind is going this way, right? But if you want to turn around, you can wear around it and turn away from the wind and go this way. Um, this guy put his boats in the water with ropes attached to them, and he pulled the ship around and then caught the wind on the other tack and entered the battle. There were several ships that got away. Um, some sailed back into Cadiz. And then it was four of them, I think it was four, uh, it took four days to sail all the way up here, and then they lost another battle with a British, a smaller bridge contingent of ships unrelated to the Battle of Trafalgar. So if you're trying to say, you know, put a pin in a map where the battle ends, it's uh, the Battle of Cape Ortegal up here is where it really ends. Um, one of the ships that's captured at that point um, survives and is towed to England, and she remains in England um, through World War II, believe it or not, still afloat and in the Royal Navy as a storage ship or something. Um, and she's actually taken out to sea in, at the end of World War II in 1945, or is it 1946? And there's film footage of her being scuttled. So there's a sh And parts of the ship are in a museum in England. Um, uh, and that was the... Um, I can never pronounce it. The Duguay Truin um, actually survived all the way to after World War II. And HMS Victory um, certainly survived the battle and is still afloat. Well, well, not afloat. Within spitting distance of the sea. But she's in Portsmouth in the United Kingdom. Nelson dies during the battle. And some of the Franco-Spanish admirals dies during the battle. Collingwood survives. Um... They, the victors, at the end of the battle from 4 o'clock through 5 o'clock and, you know, up until 8 o'clock, um, spent a lot of time towing. They, they prepare their ships to tow the damaged ships of the enemy that they've taken. The, you know, the enemy's ships have surrendered. The ones that have remained in, you know, the vicinity are now, you know, English property, and they are taken in tow. The idea is they're going to get towed into Gibraltar. But this big storm finally breaks that night and the following days. So the ships never really leave this area. They kind of try to fight their way out. The idea is, like, if you get caught on what's called a lee shore, L-E-E, -E, lee, um, when the wind is blowing this way, this is a terrible place to be because you can, you can, you can sail downwind, but it's very difficult to go against the wind, especially in a storm. So all the ships that were in the battle are terribly damaged, there's been great loss of life, and the sails are all torn to ribbons, and now they have to fight um, just to stay alive. And what happens is a lot of the ships that have been captured are cut loose a couple days later, and some of the survivors in Cadiz two days later come back out, and they recapture some of the ships and bring them back into, um, or try to get them back into Cadiz. Um, at this point, Collingwood is the admiral now, and it must have been quite a shock to see his what he thought his defeated enemy come back out a couple days later and attack. Um, and all of this is to show that the battle didn't really end um, with the with the destruction of the um, the French ship, the uh, the Achilles, at four o'clock on the twenty first. The battle really encompasses this storm that uh, you know eventually sinks a bunch of the ships that they had captured sends a bunch onto the rocks over here. Um, I don't think any f uh, British ships subsequently were damaged in the storm, but they were, I mean, literally limping back to get into port. They were all, None of them were really fit for service for a long time afterwards. 
So there is no real end date to when the battle ended. The shooting stopped around 4 or 5 o'clock, though. And uh, to summarize, the Franco-Spanish fleet came out. They saw the British fleet. They turned around to try to go back in. They had a big battle. The British won unambiguously um, using Nelson's strategy. Nelson gets killed. at the. At, he gets shot about 1.15 in the afternoon, and then he dies three hours and 45 minutes later or three hours and 15 minutes later. But at that point, Collingwood is now in charge, the other admiral. Um, because Nelson is taken below on board the victory. And he lives long enough to know that they've won a great victory. And he dies a hero, because when word gets back to England that Nelson, A, you know, defeated the Franco-Spanish fleet, he was already famous and lionized already for his previous exploits. This, is, this has not been his first battle. But also that he dies at the height of the battle is a real hero's death that uh, we just don't see in the history books very often. I can't think of a similar case. Certainly there's no American admiral you know, dying at the height of a battle that he later wins, and then the winning of that battle secures the safety of the entire nation, which is exactly what happened at Trafalgar. Like, um, the, the, after this battle ended, for further context, um, there were no other giant fleet actions with... 30 ships on one side and you know that you know it scores on the other side there were some smaller you know battles but it it, it the Tra trafalgar had wound up being exactly what the english wanted it to be they they were able to neutralize the french and the spanish uh, danger and the napoleon doesn't get defeated in 1805 he still has uh, you know free reign on dry land but england and the soil of you know the united kingdom is safe now from invasion. And then Nelson um, has died. And so, you know, imagine the newspapers of the day. They uh, they have this hero now. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's like a storybook hero that, you know, because of his passing at the height of his fame, he didn't live on to have scandal or to appear in the news in an unfavorable light, or or to lose a battle in the future, right? Like, he's, his, uh, his reputation had suffered some tarnish based on his, some of his behaviors, but that was all forgotten, and uh, he is to this day revered, and he's England's greatest naval hero. So that's 22 minutes. I think this is a better version of the one that I taped and then deleted. I'm going to listen to it and see if I like it, and if I like it, I'll upload it. But I... I know that I needed to give this like arching, you know, beginning to end story of the whole battle because I keep referring to it, assuming that everybody knew what I was talking about. One of the reasons I did this series of videos is because I didn't see a video like it. You know, I would like to see videos where people talk about the minutia of the Battle of Trafalgar, and I just don't see them out there. You know, I just don't see them. And there's so many histories that just kind of skip across some of the events of what happened that day, but none of them seem to tell the whole story. And I'm still trying to learn more about it, but uh, hopefully you've heard this and find it interesting too, and you'll find some good sources. So please comment if you'd like to comment, and uh, thanks for listening, and I'll, I'll see you the next time I upload a video. Good night.